Albert Einstein once said that all religions, arts and sciences are branches of the same tree. As today's technology and global risks race ahead of our understanding and stretch the boundaries of humanity, we face unprecedented ethical conundrums. I believe that reaching beyond the sciences and religion to that third branch, the arts, offers essential insight into these challenges. I call ethical decision-making on the borders of humanity, ethics on the edge. We all teeter on the edge. How do we define a life well lived in a partly virtual world? Where do we look for moral guidelines and truth when curated selves befriend each other through algorithms? How do we make conscionable decisions in the uncharted territory of civilian space travel, designer genetics, and artificial intelligence? And what about the problems that are still on the ethical edge, but shouldn't be, such as inequality or racism? Please join me in conversation with some of the world's leading artists and arts world pioneers as we explore some of today's most challenging ethical questions through the lens of the visual and performing arts, architecture, and literature. Sensei, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be your student, Absolute but it's pleasure. particularly yeah. an honor to be here in this capacity. Absolute pleasure. I hope I can add something to the, uh, the big discussion. I'm sure you will. Before we start with the ethics-focused discussion, mm -hmm. could we please take a step back and could you tell me a little bit about Shotokan? What is it and how is it that mm -hmm. it became the center of your life from such a very okay. young age? Well, as you probably know, there's many, there are many styles of karate and Shotokan is one of the most widely disseminated. One of the reasons is because it's very sort of attractive karate. It's big scale, very dynamic and sharp and crisp. And one of the other reasons is that uh, there were a whole bunch of very charismatic instructors that were sent out specifically to build organizations around the world in the 60s. So anyone doing karate in the late 60s, early 70s was probably doing Shotokan. Um, I would say probably 90% of the late 60s oh, karate practitioners. That. Yeah, and the other things, the other styles came in a bit later and in smaller smaller numbers, but Shotokan was huge. So I was very fortunate to start with a style that I subsequently chose to stay with when there were choices. Shotokan karate contains the three sort of elements of all karate training. It's kihon, kata, and kumite. Kihon are the basics, which you might pound up and down for many, many repetitions. Kumite is the pair work, sometimes translated as sparring wrongly, because it really means exchanging techniques. And kata, kata are the forms, and the forms are the sort of ancient sort of template of movements that most martial arts styles that have any history to them will contain. And that's all the different various techniques, the different ways of moving, all contained in a sort of, almost like a formula that you can then you know, learn from over the years by simply practicing. So you started very young. Could you tell us a little bit about one particular period which is very unique for you, which is when you went to the three-year Japanese instructor's program in Tokyo? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that experience. When I went to Japan, I'd been doing karate for about 15 years. And I'd always been drawn to, to this sort of austere environment of, of Japan. And uh, I felt that in London and in New York, where I'd lived before, there were too many distractions. And so you sort of, you do karate as a hobby, but you can't sort of throw yourself into it. So Japan, I felt, would be the only place, not just the ideal environment, but the only place I could do that. So I went to Japan, and talking about commitment, as soon as I committed, bang, I had a place to stay, and, and everything started getting clearer and clearer for me. So I stayed in a dormitory, in a dojo, um, and uh, I lived there for a year and a half, and trained every morning there, would train late morning at the headquarters of the JKA and then I would train in the evening. And uh, one of the things that I decided when I went there was that I am not going to be a flaky foreigner. I'm going to do it the proper way. And if I get into the instructor's class, which is my secret ambition, then fantastic. Um, but uh, I was going to do it on the, on the basis of doing the right thing in the right way and following the sort of Japanese technique. So I had to I had to observe all the time and um, not make any, you know, foreign sort of faux pas. 
So uh, I approached it in that way, and uh, and you know that clearly was the right thing to do because I had a good level when I went there, but I behaved as if I was just starting from zero, mm -hmm. and I was nervous because I really wanted this to happen. So I didn't want to make any mistakes, and I just watched and just tried my best, kept my head down, and that happened to be the perfect attitude for them. They they loved the fact that I worked very hard. I was pretty good. So the instructor I, course myself. is three years. I was there for two years before I joined it, so um, other people have joined the instructor's course, quite a few other people, but they haven't had the approach or the build-up. They've had a letter and they've gone in there and hadn't had a clue what was coming. Whereas I had these two years and of course I built up a, a bit of a social life so as well. So what was coming? Well, basically it feels like they're trying to make you quit for three years. That's what it feels like. You can do nothing right. And there was a certain moment, and this is why the book's called Just Say Us, there was a certain moment where ridiculous things that I wasn't doing wrong, I was berated for. And you get frustrated. And in the end, you just think, ah, oh, sod it, you know. I am wrong about everything. And that was extremely liberating, <laughs> you know, where you just realize I'm always going to be wrong. So I'm just going to keep my head down, just work away. They'll tell me I'm an idiot. And I'll just say us and carry on with it, boom, boom, boom. And then before you know it, the three years is up. And then before you know it, people are calling you sensei everywhere. And you've got the respect of your peers. and how many foreigners have actually completed that course? Well, there's rumours of others, but uh, there were two before me. And in both cases, they left Japan immediately after. Um, I stayed because I, I just really loved it. And I, I do get a feeling, not these particular guys necessarily, but I do get a feeling that some instructors do karate for a living or do karate to a, mm. a very great degree because they're very good at it. They don't necessarily love it. It's not necessarily... Uh, an, an ineffable mm. sort of drive. Um, they, they just happen to be very good at it and it's kind of convenient and I'll do karate for a living. Whereas for me, I just love it. I love every aspect of it. So when I went to Japan, I loved living there. I loved, I mean, it was very hard, of course, you know, but uh, I loved the training, I loved the instructors, I was fascinated by everything. And then over the years, especially when I started just saying os and just accepting that I was always wrong, I started seeing the flaws in everyone else. I started, instead of being ego-driven and resentful for being told off, I started just being very calm about it and just in my own mind saying, well, he doesn't really know what he's talking about. I kind of know more than this guy. Mm -hmm. And then I, that was my reward, mm -hmm. to be sort of given the key to unlock the door for, for, for my own knowledge to come through. And so um, I did the three years, I graduated, but I stayed in Japan because I, I, I was enjoying it so much. And stayed for another four years or so. And uh, in those four years I was teaching all the time. I had my own dojo, which made it terrific. The only reason I left Japan, to be honest, mm. was because I'd hit a ceiling. I was 35, 36. I'd hit a ceiling of what I could achieve in that very hierarchical world. And I knew I would have to wait 10, 15, 20 years. My, my seniors were still pretty young and, and extremely fit, so they weren't going to allow anyone to leapfrog them. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing much for them anyway. So it was sort of frustrating for me uh, to know that that was going to be where I was going to be at. So I thought, well, OK, let's leave. And uh, New adventures. New York seemed like a good place. So how influential do you think the arts are on the ethics or the ethical situations of their day or of future generations? And you can mm. speak to martial arts or you can speak to all of the arts that your friends were doing, whether it's visual arts mm. or performing arts. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll stick to karate and if, okay. I, if I sidestep a little bit, um, then I'll do that. But um, with, with karate, I think it's extremely important because, um, you know, you have... We, we don't experience warfare now, not close to home, because it's been very, very controlled, you know, rightly so, in a school environment and everywhere else. So the, the, there's a sort of suppression of these violent tendencies that mankind has. So how do you address that? You know, and either things might go towards, you know, the sort of UFC or, or any of these extremely violent martial arts, or, you know, you have to sort of codify them and ritualize them. And this is where the art form comes in for me because you know, karate as an art, I believe, takes an element of real life, picks it apart, exaggerates it, ritualizes it, and then puts it back together in a form that is uh, a sort of more heightened, elevated reality. 
So that's what karate does for me. It allows for sort of safe violence. And if that's not sort of an oxymoron, you know, you have this sort of environment where you're reproducing extremely dangerous scenarios and getting the same chemical reaction going in the body with that. Mm -hmm. But it's ultimately controlled and it's at a higher level. So. Would you say it's also setting a standard for how people should be behaving generally in society? Well, you know, I mean, the dojo is a sort of microcosm of society mm -hmm. where you have, you know, older and younger, more experienced, less experienced, more intelligent, less intelligent, and everybody has to merge and blend in an appropriate way. And mm -hmm. so ultimately the dojo environment builds a sort of consideration mm -hmm. for others. You know, when you consider pairing up with someone who's really strong and gung-ho and young and, and wants to wants to take a hit to the stomach, well, you can give them that, you know, it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And then you might have someone who's not interested in that. Mm -hmm. They just want to refine the technique and get a bit of finesse. Mm -hmm. So it's appropriate to move in a slightly different way there. And, mm -hmm. and so it is with society, I mm -hmm. think. So one of the things that I've observed in your classes is very much that point, which is that everybody needs to be very observant mm -hmm. and in a karate sort of way, do a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. And one could say that that's a foundation for ethical behavior and it's something that's not always well, uh, prevalent in today's, yeah, in today's society. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very fond of saying that, you know, we have to trace our roots back to the battlefield mm -hmm. where there has to be a military aspect of discipline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within that aspect of discipline, you know, you, there are certain freedoms, but there's always a line that you have to draw. And so the dojo environment has this militaristic sort of, you just have to do as you're told. Mm -hmm. You have to follow the rules. And so it's not a free-for-all by any stretch, and I'm constantly mm -hmm. having to remind mm -hmm. people of that because mostly in their lives they are very free. Mm -hmm. That leads me to, to my next question, which mm -hmm. is what ethical responsibility, if any, do you think artists have, martial artists in particular, mm -hmm. but ethical responsibility perhaps within the dojo but even outside the dojo? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm, I mean, I've obviously as a teacher I'm giving a lot of commands, but mm -hmm. I prefer to lead by example. So. Mm -hmm. You, you have that responsibility of representing a sort of mm -hmm. higher ideal when you're in this role of, of the sensei because a sensei is not a teacher necessarily, it's not really a coach. Mm -hmm. It uh, literally translates as someone who's lived before. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of setting this example of where you, you suppose others should go and the way you behave yourself and carry yourself, of course, it's a, it's a huge mm -hmm. responsibility. And it would, be, it would be disingenuous to think that I didn't influence my students. Mm -hmm. So that kind of responsibility, I, I've, I feel it quite a lot. And uh, you see these kids grow up and meet them when they're in their late 20s and you knew them when they were seven years old. And the parents or, or them themselves will say, well, you know, I have no idea how you helped me through school. Right. So building character and discipline and responsibility for ethical decision making outside the dojo yeah, as well. building judgment mm -hmm. and these kinds of things, mm -hmm. they're all in the dojo. I think. And we're in this social media world where mm -hmm. the tendency is to try to see how we can, what the young people say, call someone out mm -hmm. or point out somebody else's weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And even better, if we can, post it all over social media. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really where a lot of the bullying and the violence mm -hmm. is happening today. Mm -hmm. But I've heard you say that one of the responsibilities to, is to try to prod each other to greatness, mm -hmm. to try to make sure that if you're working in pairs or you're working in a class mm -hmm. situation that part of the responsibility is to help the other person be better. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that also carries out into how you, uh, your students, but followers and, and students of, of Shotokan Karate more generally are mm -hmm. engaging in society? Well, yeah, I, I absolutely think that's true. And, um, you know, the, the whole idea of, of nurturing the other person, I mean, this is sort of a basic mm -hmm. philosophy. And, you know, I often say to the students, you know, if you're stronger than someone, mm -hmm. then you're going to take advantage of that. Is that the sort of person you have to be? Mm -hmm. Or if you're weaker than someone, you shouldn't be afraid of that person. You should be looking to learn from them. So that kind of relationship that you have in the dojo with these, you know, stronger and weaker people, I think it, it, it exists in every mm -hmm. facet of society. So I often sort of question the sort of Socratic method, you know, mm -hmm. if you're stronger than him, you want to make him feel bad? Right. Is that what you're doing right now? Right. Is that the sort of person you want to be? So this is a, ultimately just a purely ethical statement, you know. So you'll find that everybody starts to agree with the positive mm -hmm. rather than say, well, yeah, I just want to make you feel bad. No one really says that. So the constant sort of reminder. And I think um, there, there's less and less sort of policing of, of those things in the modern world. And uh, self-policing doesn't really exist that much. You know, everyone's encouraged to express themselves, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it can be chaotic as well. Right. 
-hmm. And certainly how one expresses oneself mm -hmm. where, and again, mm -hmm. whether it's through social media or whether it's in mm -hmm. private, whether we think about the consequences of what we're saying, mm -hmm. I think is something that is incredibly valuable in terms of certainly in the dojo, we mm -hmm. think about the consequences of a kick or a punch, mm -hmm. hopefully before we do it, as you say, depending mm -hmm. on the person in front well, of us. Well, also here's the art form as well, because you know when you pair up with someone, you're not really kicking them expecting to put them down. Right. You're not really looking to damage someone. You're not really engaged in battle. So, but you pretend, and that pretending, that pretentiousness, if you like, is, uh, is, is true of, of all art. You know, it, it's not the real thing. It's that element of the real thing that's expanded and finessed, if you like. And then uh, you have a better understanding of the actual reality based on your experience of analyzing uh, a key element. You have certain ethical principles and karate has certain standards or principles um, mm -hmm. that are the foundation for the decision making that happens in this martial art. Mm -hmm. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about where you get your own ethical principles? Is it from karate? Is it from religion? Is it from family? Is it from political well, leaders or friends? That's uh, a huge question. Where do I mean, you get I, your I would true say, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a fair amount of freedom during my day. Mm -hmm. So you sort of have to choose how you spend that. And, and I think um, also by pure chance, you know, the people you've come very close to in life. I mean, certainly my father was an extremely uh, ethical person to a fault. And uh, he always worked for charities, he worked for the National Health Service in England, etc, etc. But, um, you know, you take that sort of root kind of example and then you look for it in others and uh, you find yourself being disappointed by some and then inspired by others. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of love the idea of self-sacrifice for a greater uh, good, you know, whether that's suffering in the dojo through sweat and hard work and then emerging, discovering something more about a technique or whether that's allowing yourself to be weaker with a, an opponent in the dojo and therefore discovering something more about yourself or facing your fears in that sense. And going to Japan and joining the instructor's class was very much about facing your fears. You know, it all seems uh, wonderful when you read about it, but when you do it on a, you know, three years in the instructor's class, I mean, I was in the, in the instructor's mm -hmm. class in total for about eight years, but three years as, a, as an apprentice where you can do nothing right you know, that's facing your fears on a daily basis. So uh, to be inspired to continue with that and see relevance in that, then, you know, you end up looking to, for my case, you know, Shakespeare had a lot to do with me. Shakespeare, any particular getting, play? Henry V, of course, you know. So I would, um, I remember Branagh came out with Henry V. Right. And I watched him and I thought, he doesn't know. <laughs> he, uh, he hasn't been beaten up every day for the last year and a half. And when you have, and you ride your bicycle to the dojo in the morning knowing that uh, you're, you're going to get laid into. You, once more onto the breach, dear friends, you know, close the wall up with our English dead. So it was not only very inspiring in, in terms of, you know, stiffening the sinews and conjuring up the blood. It was also, you know, you have to get tribal in a way. And it was very, it's his most sort of patriotic English play. Well, and you've, so you've spoken about in the past getting tribal in the sense that the mm -hmm. Japanese have a way of doing things. Mm -hmm. You're not Japanese, mm -hmm. um, but you speak Japanese and mm -hmm. you're certainly an expert on the Japanese martial art, but you've, you've spoken in the past about this idea of mm -hmm. otherness mm -hmm. and that that was also part of the, part of the well, training. You know, and, and also part of the training and part of life is, you know, uh, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a classic cliche. And uh, when you go to Japan, you can't be Japanese, but you can't sort of doggedly stick to your guns in another sense. You've got to you got to you know, play the game and, uh, and, and join in with what they're doing and how it works and then you understand it from the inside. Mm -hmm. And of course that's part of strategy of, of warfare mm -hmm. as well. Understanding how the enemy thinks is a huge, huge advantage and it's the basic sort of mm -hmm. concept of warfare strategy like Sun Tzu and, mm -hmm. and these ancient texts, you know, they talk about, you know, know yourself and you'll win 50% of the battles. Know the other person, you'll win 50% of the battles. Know both yourself and the other person, you're going to win all the time. So, you know, there was uh, all these elements and when you read these ancient texts and these philosophies, you find them in your karate practice if, if, you, if you look hard enough. Well, and certainly if we look at mm -hmm. how politicians today and others are making ethical decisions or unethical decisions mm -hmm. that affect others, mm -hmm. this notion of putting themselves in other people's shoes would certainly go a long way to the quality well, of decision making. Well, absolutely, um, and, and not looking for personal gain. 
you know, looking, it's another cliche, you know, if, uh, it, it's better to give than to receive, you know, I mean, everybody knows that, but you have a chance to practice it in a dojo. You have a chance to give someone the benefit of achieving the technique mm -hmm. by your efforts, they're, they're getting better. That's a really nice feeling. And so you start to be more comfortable with that on a, on a more complete basis. Before we move on from this question of principles, mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit about the principles of Shotokan Karate, the ethical principles? The ethical and principles? Well, as I mentioned, you know, there are these different formats that you work. So mm -hmm. when you're on your own doing the kihon, doing the mm -hmm. basics, you're basically seeing if you can be true to yourself. In other words, you're always asking yourself, am I doing this right? Am I working on the right points? Am I really evolving or am I just coasting? Well, the mind and body uh, dichotomy, you know, that exists uh, when you're on your own, it's very difficult. And then when you're with a partner, then you have to resist the sort of ego. And I think the way we do our pair work in Shotokan is really conducive to working very well with a partner, especially how I do my classes. I like to make it extremely hard work, whatever level you're at. So it sort of levels the playing field, if you like. And, uh, and so, you know, a weaker person can have a really challenging experience with a stronger person who will also be challenged. And then you have the, the kata, which are aesthetically the, the sort of big reward, you know, because they're very, uh, very challenging but very beautiful to watch and perform. Can we speak a little bit about the principles of movement? Mm -hmm. You're very articulate about some core principles of movement. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a few of the most important ones and how they might translate into life or mm -hmm. ethical decision making more broadly? Well, I, I mean, I guess they do in a way. You know, you move, you move from the core mm -hmm. and, you know, by definition, that's a sort of profound source of movement rather than moving from the outside, which by definition is superficial. So you're developing a sort of a trust and a belief in, in profound things. Mm -hmm. You are grounded because every movement, every movement starts from the floor mm -hmm. and goes through the legs and out the core, if you like. So you know, to be grounded, and these are all sort of metaphors for, mm -hmm. for life, you know, to be, to be centered and grounded, to move mm -hmm. from something within rather than something external. You know, all these core principles are, are relevant in, a, in, a, in an ethical sense mm -hmm. and in a movement sense. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you talk recently about <clears throat> fully committing. Uh, oh, yeah. And in, in, in the particular example, it was fully committing with a punch or a kick. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain a little bit about why that's so important in karate and, and also how that might, uh, again, well, translate know, into uh, life? Again, we, we try and hedge our bets and we, we, we have these fears and we try and manipulate the circumstance so we don't have to face those fears. You know, whether it's pairing up with someone or, or, or doing a business deal or, or whatever. If, you're, if you've cultivated this being true to yourself and this sort of profound sense of movement, then you have to trust it and you have to just go. And the thing we were talking about with uh, commitment the other day was, um, you know, basically how you can't anticipate what's going to happen in the future. Nobody knows. So if you don't commit yourself, you're never going to fully appreciate the moment. So when you fully commit yourself and you survive it and it actually comes out quite well, you start to believe in yourself and then you start to be comfortable committing to certain things rather than being hesitant. And what happens if it doesn't turn out so well? Well, you did something wrong, you know, obviously, but, you know, if you have a core set of principles and you believe in those, then you have to live by them. Mm -hmm. And that includes, you know, ethical things, but it also includes movement. Mm -hmm. And you know you're going to use the floor. You know you're going to use from, move from the center. As soon as you start thinking uh, or worrying, your consciousness comes higher and higher. You start to move from your shoulders. You start to think things which doesn't work in movement because movement is reflexive. Mm -hmm. It happens instantaneously. You can't think movement, you have to feel movement. Mm -hmm. So again, you start to commit yourself more and more, you start to feel the value of that. And then you can detach the mind and observe. And then you're in a much higher state of consciousness. And when you detach the mind and observe, you can make multiple um, decisions that don't affect the movement because it's a detached perspective. Does that make any sense? It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think about how that would translate well into ethical decision making, but let's come back to that a in a bit. Well, you know, I think it does because, um, you know, when you detach yourself, mm -hmm. you're no longer within the sort of ego, mm -hmm. if you like. It's no longer about you. Mm -hmm. You're seeing yourself as part of a bigger picture. And so whether it's politics or, or, or business, mm -hmm. I imagine, mm -hmm. you're seeing the whole circumstance instead of being blinded by your own desires. And certainly the moving from the core, running a business or running government mm -hmm. from the core, which would be principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would, I would you know, say so. Certainly yeah. applies. Yeah. 
and, um. and knowing that if you have your principles, you know, providence moves, you know, and, and you, 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 you do things based on, on a really real moral judgment. Mm -hmm. And therefore you will get judged on a moral basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll, you'll look back and, you know, you, you mm -hmm. spoke, one of your questions was about, you know, responsibility and, and these things. And I think everyone don't need a responsibility as an artist necessarily, but I think everyone wants a legacy of some sort. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you want to be looked upon kindly, which is why politicians at the end of their tenure tend to start, uh, you know, giving Doing grand the speeches. Doing humanitarian thing. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, can we shift gears a little bit mm -hmm. and talk about the business side? Mm -hmm. Karate has uh, a number of organizations. There's a, a, real, a practical reality to running mm -hmm. a business, not just to running a dojo, but to some of the international organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've spoken about uh, the politics of some of them. There's mm -hmm. the JKA, the Japanese Karate Association. Mm -hmm. There's your organization now, the WTKO. Mm -hmm. So if you can talk a little bit about uh, the any ethical conundrums that you've faced in, in the business side of this martial okay. art. Well, as far as, I mean, on a pure basic sort of business side, the only ethical conundrum I have is to maintain my integrity and yet be able to still have, uh, you know, yeah. still feed myself, you know. Right. In other words, I have to promote mm -hmm. to a degree, but it's, it's how to do that in a non-promotional way. That's not mm -hmm. too, you know, of a contradiction. But um, as far as the organizations go, I mean, it, it is normal and um, I formed with a colleague of mine, John Mullin, I formed a WTKO with, with a view of never being involved in politics. But of course, as soon as anything gets on any scale, you have to delegate to certain people. Mm -hmm. And you start delegating to certain people, then in a way you have to control them, and controlling them is politics. Mm -hmm. So it, it, is, it is a real conundrum. You know, how do you want the organization to grow on a large scale? Or do you want to be able to control a very small scale that's you know perfect and exquisite, mm -hmm. which is hopefully what I can achieve in the dojo, in my own dojo. Mm -hmm. But in the organization, you're dealing with others, so therefore you're immediately in the political realm. But you nonetheless have a mm. politic or an ethos mm. of being open. You don't exclude people because they're members of other associations. Oh, well that, you don't, that, all that kind of thing. For me, that's not yeah. even politics. That's just right. trivia. Yeah. Right. So, you know, for me, politics is, is more about, you know, um, in the organization, in, in any case, it's more about the direction as a group we're going. Uh, as far as, you know, people coming and going, I mean, uh, I'm horrified to imagine that some instructors would tell their students they can't go somewhere to learn. Mm -hmm. um, that just for me indicates mm -hmm. insecurity, you know, mm -hmm. are they going to learn something that's more attractive right. than what you're teaching? And I, I don't think I suffer from that and uh, if I did, I would definitely catch myself and say, hang on a minute. <laughs> you must be doing something wrong. Look again at yourself and what you're doing. Well, I remember having a conversation with Ubo Sensei at one point mm -hmm. and I asked him a very simple question, which is, mm. how do you get that good? Mm -hmm. And he said when he was much younger, he studied with many, many, many different people. Mm -hmm. And that it was a little bit of what you were saying. It's about mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't want to exclude people, but also you want to be really observing. Mm -hmm. um, many well, you know, like, uh, like any art, there are certain ground rules, mm -hmm. and you have to set those ground rules in the first few years. And uh, karate takes a little bit longer because it's, um, I mean, for example, my, my wife, auntie, of course, runs the yoga and they have the yoga teacher training. So you can become a teacher in a few months. Whereas in karate that would be kind of ridiculous. Not because yoga is more difficult, but because the karate movement is so particular. It's so fast, so precise, so reliant on reflex that you need years and years and years. So you need that groundwork of years and years and years. And then you start exploring and you start opening up and you start taking and by then of course you have the judgment to be able to know what's relevant and what's not relevant. So um, being open to, to those things uh, is essential and an essential part of any art. You know, if it's not uh, growing and evolving, then... Karate takes a long time to even to be able to understand what you're seeing when you are consciously listening or observing. Well, to, to develop a reflex, mm -hmm. it takes, you know, there's the famous 10,000, you know, 10,000 repetitions or 10,000 hours. Or the number 10,000 keeps coming up and... Uh, it was, um, you know, one of those annoying moments when you, you read something about, uh, about that and, and Gladwell was talking about it, the 10,000 repetitions, and I thought, oh, God, that's, that was my idea, you know. <laughs> but, of, of course, it's on a bigger, more right. universal scale, and uh, I always thought it was kind of interesting that the Japanese way of counting is, uh, you know, you count in tens, in hundreds, in thousands, then in ten thousands, there's a word for 10,000, mm -hmm. and then the next one is a hundred ten thousands. 
you know, so they don't have a word for million, but they do have a word for 10,000. And so is that part of this sort of the depth of the Japanese culture with this kind of repetitive drilling lifelong practice? I don't know, but it's a sort of interesting thing. What has been the most important ethical conundrum that you've faced in life, personally or professionally? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really a, a fighter, <laughs> and yet somehow I'm doing a, a fighting art for, for my life's work. So, you know, you sort of have to go between being extremely fierce, but letting everyone know you're pretending to be fierce just to experience that. But mm -hmm. Actually, you're, you're more of a philosophical person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, trying to balance that because then you find, of course, you know, some people take liberties mm -hmm. and they want to try it on. So then you have this sort of ethical conundrum, do I hit this guy so he learns the lesson the blunt way? Or do I try and, you know, influence him over time? And very often you don't have that time. And, uh, I must very say, often, of all the artists you know, I'm interviewing, I think you're the only one who's going to say something like that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's happened to me a couple yeah. of times where in, in really, and this is another thing with, uh, with you know, trusting your, 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 you know, your sort of core principles. And if you practice that enough, you tend to then trust that you're going to make the right decision. So uh, one time, I, I won't say who it was, but a guy in France was a, a big, strong character. I moved to Paris for a couple of years. I'd been there about a month. He came to the dojo and he really tried it on. Mm -hmm. And um, I hit him pretty hard. He went around Paris, around France actually, saying, I've never been hit more correctly. And so it, there was a certain morality behind right. what I did. You know, I put him in his place and he sort of woke up to knowing that he had been a bully for all the students in the class mm -hmm. for some very strange reason. I never do it. I asked him to do a bit of sparring at the end of the class. All the students were watching. I never do that. But somehow I just trusted the, the feeling that I had. So that was certainly a conundrum, but it worked out pretty well. So I don't advocate doing that sort of right. thing. But you know, when it happens, it's spontaneous and it's uh, um, you know it's sincere. Then it's part of the life of, of the karate person. At least we're not in the seventies where people would show up at the at the dojo, you know, challenging the instructor, you know, in that sort of corny way. Who's tougher? But you don't get that anymore. You know? So speaking of ethical conundrums, generally, uh, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of discussion about karate in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So what is your thinking about um, the... Well, you know, it, it won't be the karate I like. That's for sure, because it's, it is an ethical problem. I mean, you are then doing karate to win a medal. And that shouldn't be. What's so, different but, about mean, the Olympics, though, mm. from the, karate comp the global karate competitions that exist within the karate world? Well, because, uh, you know, the Olympics is not like our competitions, which are provincial. So no one aspires to glory in our competitions because it's very strictly defined. There's hardly anyone watching, you know, so the ego doesn't get involved to the degree that it does with the Olympics. And the whole celebrity question that's so well, much exactly. part of society Sponsorship today. Sponsorship and money and fame and glory. Mm -hmm. All these things are exactly what you shouldn't be doing karate on a daily basis for life mm -hmm. for. However, I'm kind of proud of the fact that karate is certainly good enough to be an excellent Olympic uh, event. Um, so, so that's great. I mean, it lends itself to that. And, and what these guys are doing, I mean, they're unbelievable athletes. Uh, they really are phenomenal. Um, and so there's a lot to be admired, but it's not, it's not for me, per se. Do you think there's a risk that some of the other bad behavior that we've seen in the Olympics and in, in mm -hmm. the kind of sporting that does attract celebrity, like the Tour de France, do you think that there mm -hmm. is a risk that we'll see things like doping with karate no in the Olympics? No doubt. Of course. Okay. Of course, because it, be it becomes a sport. Okay. And all sport nowadays mm -hmm. is, is money and fame, you know, and there's a huge amount of money sloshing around, which I don't have. I mean, I, I, I uh, make a living from karate, but I certainly don't do it for money. I mean, um, and the money and fame is even uh, mm -hmm. more important today with social media. It used to be that we would all sit around the television mm -hmm. and watch the Olympics at a very specific time. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't there at 8 p.m., you missed the figure skating or yeah, you missed yeah. mm -hmm. uh, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, now everything's recorded, everything's bits and pieces are sent around on social media, sound bites, well, you know, the stats are analyzed yeah. and discussed and everything becomes yeah. a big deal. Mm -hmm. So every single technique you throw is a big deal. And so you're, you're gonna be very self-conscious about that. And, um, you know, then you have the entertainment factor. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in boxing, for example, I mean, as great as Ali was, I mean, he was the original, you know, loudmouth, if you like. Right. Um, but it was him. Right. 
but everyone else is copying that, so it right. becomes out of control. For the know. entertainment as opposed to the yeah, sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that's what happens there as well. So if we could look outward to society more generally, what do you think is society's biggest or one or two biggest ethical challenges today? Selfishness, I suppose. You know, it's all about me now. And I think that's really in a wrong direction, you know. I mean, helping others and everything else sounds like a sort of, you know, sort of softy liberal kind of, kind of approach. But, um, you know, if it goes too much the other way, then, uh, you know, I mean, liberalism leads to selfishness as well if it goes too far. You know, everything has its, its finite point where it comes back to square one again. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there, there is too much about, you know, I deserve this and I deserve that and this sort of sense of entitlement and everything else. And, um, you know, I very often talk to my, my kids, you know, they get kind of upset with each other if someone does something better mm -hmm. than them or, or they perceive they're cheating or something mm -hmm. like this. And, you know, if they are cheating, uh, and I tell these kids, you know, if they're cheating, then it's going to come back to them mm. in another way. And if they're cheating and you suffer because of it, you've got to take it on the chin sometimes. You know, but nobody wants to take it on the chin, right. you know. And so society has this problem of everything's insured up to the eyeballs, so nothing can go wrong. There are times when good people mm -hmm. don't do well and when bad people sure, do well, and that's part of life. It is part of life, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's a really huge question, but uh, we try and sort of... Uh, go a little bit of a way to answering it in the dojo. You know, sometimes it's not fair. You know, sometimes things hurt, and you know, this guy's got more flexible ankles than I have, so his stances are lower. It's not fair, or whatever it is. But you know, I think through the complexity of Shotokan Karate, everyone has their little moments where they're excelling in something. So you mentioned Henry V. Are there other works of art, visual art, uh, dance works? Uh, any other works of art that you would say are particularly important or that resonated particularly with you in terms of ethical messages or an ethical experience? Um, in terms of ethics, well, you know, like I said, there is the Shakespeare and things like this, but in, in terms of other literature, um, I tend to read a little bit more for pleasure, you know. Um, if I read more serious stuff, uh, if I read anything martial arts related, it's normally... Uh, sort of biographies of the sort of greats or the, or the writings of the greats and uh, it's another thing talking about society now you know I mean we're all we're all diluted because we all do a million different things there are no there are no specialists anymore I mean I'm kind of a specialist mm -hmm. and I suppose I am actually to a large degree because you know I live and work and do everything sort of around karate and things like this but in, you know in the old days you know, a guy who made a pair of shoes, that's all he did from morning till night. Fully committed again. Fully committed. So, you know, a lot of the older writings, you know, whether it's on strategy or, or technique or, or just the, the life of a warrior, they were really, really profound because that's all they did and that's all they thought about. And so they had no distractions where everyone's distracted now. So, What would be one or two of those kinds of works that you might recommend? Well, you know, there's, there's, there's the two big big tomes, if you like, on, on strategy, which is the Miyamoto Musashi, who was a great swordsman in the early 17th century, the Gorin no Sho, which is the Book of Five Rings, mm -hmm. Sun Tzu, The Art of War, which is, uh, you know... It's now even assigned in business schools. Well, exactly, you know, so, uh, I mean, there are principles there, and I think the problem with that is when they are assigned to business schools, they're generally rewritten for the business person. Diluted again. Diluted, and also it's like cut to the chase. What's the takeaway? Right. You know, you'll go to a lecture two or three hours and then they'll be like, in five minutes, give me the takeaway so I don't have to bother with the three hours. And that's only three hours. You know, what about 30 years? You know, and you should, anything really profound should be kind of hard work to unlock. So um, I think there is a, it's a real problem in modern society. I certainly agree with yeah. you in terms of ethical decisions. I think mm -hmm. it is the 10,000... Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, kicks, mm -hmm. punches, mm -hmm. it's thinking over and over again and assessing and analyzing and listening. And this is a classic artist thing, you know, the struggle. Mm. I mean, not to mention anyone's name, but if he'd gone down to Australia's barrier reef, killed that shark and put it in formaldehyde himself, it would have been fantastic. But he had an idea. And a whole and bunch of people else, do it easily, you know. Right. Didn't get his hands dirty necessarily. I'm, I mean, I don't Team really know what I'm talking about. people executed the technique. Yeah, right. but the, but that sort of strikes me as, as what happens sometimes, you know. And um, the struggle, the, the struggle is is key 
to the arts, and therefore you you know you discover yourself, you discover something more. And back to the point about commitment, you know, when you struggle, you commit to a certain tortuous path, and then the reward at the end is that much greater. I mean, I drove across the country a couple of times, and uh, I remember driving a really boring route. You know, I went up to Chicago and across Iowa and Omaha and all that kind of stuff, and then I went south in Nebraska and started seeing for the first time in days some features when I got to Colorado, I was high as a kite. But if I'd flown in to the Rockies... You wouldn't have appreciated I'd it. I'd have thought, well, you know, this is pretty nice. Yeah, what's next? Yeah. So you have to struggle to appreciate things. And, um, and I think that's part of the arts, and I think that's part of the problem of modern society, where it's there, boom, right now. What would you recommend to our two presidential candidates, Mr. Trump and Secretary okay. Clinton, if you had to recommend well, one word. four presidential candidates. The, the other two right. have got no chance at all. The other all. two have got no chance. So the two that yeah. have the greatest chance, what would you mm. recommend that they read or watch or look at if there were, was sort of one work that had an ethical message, what would it be? Well, again, I think actually there should be four because officially there mm. are four actually and they should all listen to each other. And that's not what they're doing. They're not listening and debating. We talk about these debates, it's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no debate. There's someone digging up something on someone else and someone digging up someone, and that's such a low level of thought process. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there may have been times when they had decided, I'm going to be above this. But they've had a little nudge and they've descended into the mud with, uh, with the other person every single time. Something that you could never do in sparring. You can't ignore the other person. Well, exactly, you can't ignore the other person. You can't pretend um, that something they did before is relevant in that moment. There is only now. And uh, of course, you know, they want to present someone's character and this and this. I think you can only lead by example. So if you start tearing the other person down, that shows a great weakness in yourself. Whereas you should just ignore that. I mean, not to talk about politics mm -hmm. too much, but I'm a huge fan of Ron Paul, mostly because of his ethics and his morality. And if he's asked a question, couldn't care less what the other person said. He has his answer, this is what he likes, this is why he likes it. And I think that's a, that's a, a tremendously appealing thing, which neither of the, the two candidates have right now. What connection do you think martial arts has with a world that is increasingly science and technology infused? I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you're standing here, everything you do is with your bare hands. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. No equipment, not mm -hmm. even like many other athletes where there's a tennis racket or there's a mm -hmm. golf club or something else. Mm -hmm. And it's quite remarkable. You don't actually need technology at all to do your art. Um, but do you think that science and technology have had any influence uh, on martial arts in general or on Shotokan karate in particular? Well, not really on my Shotokan, but they have, you know, mentioned in the Olympics, they certainly have with that because, you know, when something gets that huge, you have to have a way to disseminate that to a, a huge, a, a really huge body of officials and then an even bigger body of spectators who are, you know, let's face it, kind of ignorant. So they have to, it has to be presented in a way that's, again, distilled and easy to understand, that cuts to the chase. That, you know, if you watch, for example, a kendo match, uh, you know, with the, with the bamboo swords, it is so fast, so esoteric and so subtle, even I can't really follow it. Karate should be a little bit more like that, in my, in my, in my sort of snobbish opinion, but it has to be made for, you know, the masses. And so, you know, you have to have very large red or blue mitts, so they're easy to see. You have to have mats because of the safety element, and also mats lend themselves to laying out the area nicely. Okay. And plus, you know, you're going to have mitts, who's going to make them? Who's mm. going to get that Olympic contract? Mm. So it starts to be watered down, you know, and the morality is lost a little bit. Mm. You know, gone are the days where, you know, you, you, I mean, I would go to a competition, I'm not that old, but I mean, back in the day, <laughs> you know, late 70s, early 80s, etc., etc., when I first started competing, you know, you roll up your karate suit in your belt, you might have it in a small bag, and that's it. You go to the tournament for the day. Whereas now they have these bags, they look like, you know, ice hockey players because they've got these huge bags with different pads and different color belts. But I think what's not just lost in terms of morality, but also in, in a sense of, you know, like the wooden floor. I mean, it's organic. Mm -hmm. You're feeling the wood and you start to appreciate, I mean, it sounds over dramatic, but you start to appreciate nature a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Where it's just you and your skin on the wooden floor. It's very different than having you know, big rubber pads on rubber mats in bright blues and reds, these sort of primary colors. Um, you have something on the wall over here. Um, before, mm -hmm. we, before we come to a close, can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about that? 
Well, you know, we, we're talking about ethics and morality mm -hmm. in these things, and we have the Dojo Kun. Mm -hmm. And the Dojo Kun is a list of five sort of moral oaths, if you like, which, which at the end of class, we, we made a decision when I first came to New York. Were we going to have it when I first started having group classes? Mm -hmm. And if we were going to have it, would we do it in English or Japanese? The problem with translating it to English is we want to nutshell it. And you can't nutshell this sort of thing. It's sort of like taking a, a, a verse of the, of the, the Bhagavad Gita or, or a, a sutra or something like this and translating it. You lose a, a lot. And of course, because it's written with the, the Chinese characters, each one of those kanji, as the Japanese call them, each one of those kanji has, it has a whole story behind it. So um, you have these five things, and the first one starts off as, you know, seek or strive towards a full, well-rounded, whole, complete character. You know, so that's sort of an impossible mm -hmm. kind of goal. But that should be what life is, you know, trying and working towards some sort of ultimate goal. So right there you have it. And of course it gets, it gets uh, uh, flipped a little bit in English. Those who speak, uh, who speak the Dojo Kun in English, they'll say seek perfection of character, mm -hmm. which sort of nutshells it, but you lose quite a lot. You still get the point, though, that this whole endeavor is about character. Absolutely, as much yeah. as about physical Yeah, I mean, the last one, that's the first one. The last one is, you know, guard against hot-blooded courage. Right. Courage is good, but hot-blooded courage, you just, you just guard against that because you're getting strong, you're getting fast. Mm -hmm. Don't start puffing your chest up. Keep your humility. So it's, it's really nice in that respect. And so we say it in Japanese after every class. And all the little kids say it in Japanese. They haven't got a clue what they're saying. So they mumble it half the time, but then they get it after a while. And then you start asking them and... Of course, the parents love that because they don't get it anywhere else, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all vie with each other who can translate it better. Well, there certainly isn't a lot of this kind of thing uh, regularly practiced or so deliberately practiced on the soccer field or in many of the other competitive well, sports. Well, because the other competitive sports, it's about winning. And if, if it's not obviously going to lead to a win, why bother? Be more efficient. Just get to, the, get to the win. It's all about Saturday's game, you know. So um, I, think, uh, I think it's nice that everything's put off, and the parents certainly like it. Um, oh, I, I keep talking about the kids because, of course, we're talking about, uh, you know, moulding character, mm -hmm. if you like. But uh, I do have an 80-year-old in class who I think his moral character has improved since he's been training <laughs> with me in the last 20 years. No but, um, uh, you know, the parents see that, and they, they love the idea that the kids might take a test every six months, and they might or might not do well. Whereas, not to mention a political uh, um, angle, but you know, the no child left behind thing, regardless, immediately you think, well, I'm not going to get left behind. I don't have to work that hard. Curiously, you're not the me. first <laughs> artist that I've had conversations with who's mentioned the no child left behind. Yeah. This idea that uh, of resilience, of mm -hmm. picking oneself up after failure, mm -hmm. uh, and of building the resilience through however many thousands of of efforts at the exercise. Well, I can't tell you. I mean, I'm certainly not a natural with, mm. with karate. And there were kids that I grew up with who were really, really good. None of them are doing it now. Mm. And people look at me and say, wow, well, you're, you're lucky you have the karate. Mm. Well, I've been doing this 43 years. You know, it's mm. taken quite a lot of work and, and a lot of struggle. And uh, I'm grateful for that. Well, you've mm. certainly built a life story that is fascinating. And you're about to uh, release a book so yes, yes, you, and long in the making. Can you tell me a little bit about the book and um, mm -hmm. what, what you want to achieve with the book? Well, as we, as we touched on before, you know, there's been quite a few books of late, not many, many, but uh, quite a few that um, have, uh, have told a story. And, um, and, and I feel that what I've been through is fairly unique, or, well, everyone's story is unique, mm -hmm. you know, but through, through my eyes, I'd like to tell my story. And, uh, you know, it starts off and it, and it crosses through this this kind of era of rapid change in, the, in sports and arts and science and everything else. Really rapid change. It's almost like the, the sort of time has been telescoped, whereas what, what's happened in the last 20 or 30 years is way more than what happened in the previous couple of hundred years, you know. So um, I think it's kind of interesting to, to abridge that. So uh, I've tried to write the book, um, you know, with as much... Um, cinematic quality, if you like, as possible, putting the reader there, which, which I found lacking in the other, in the other mm -hmm. stories. And, uh, and I know that uh, those experiences can't be had anymore. And that's part of my teaching also, to try to give everyone 
as quickly, as intelligently, as in-depth as possible, a distillation of my experience, and that's the real challenge for me. And some of what comes through in your teaching and in your, in your speaking is very much a reminder of where all of this came from and for what sure, greatness yeah. was mm -hmm. however many centuries ago. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, tremendous respect for those, those people because they don't have the advantages we have, and yet somehow mm -hmm. they achieved in, apparently far more. You know, and the way they write and the way they view things and, and the morality of that because they're not doing it to be famous. And um, people aren't doing it for instant reward. Um, and I, that really appeals to me. It's interesting that so much of this is now, in terms of karate today, mm -hmm. is centered on is somehow fame involved mm -hmm. or related factors like sponsorship. And mm -hmm. certainly in much of my work, celebrity is one of the biggest drivers of unethical behavior. Mm -hmm. So this fight to keep celebrity out of this art, I think, mm -hmm. is very, very critical. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, that whole keeping up with the Joneses, it's all about the ego. And, you know, everybody knows. You can talk to a child about, you know, a sense of self and ego and this and this, and they'll get it. Mm -hmm. And they'll agree with you. But we all fall victim to it. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what have I not asked you that I should have? Good question. I don't know. I think we've pretty much covered most of those ethical questions. Okay. Well, Sensei, it's been an honor. Well, we very really much look pleasure. forward yeah. to the book. Well, uh, thank uh, yes. you so much again yeah. for having me. Well, actually, just to mention the book again, not to plug it, but uh, please uh, do. The, the title is is just say os, and os is a word that's pretty low class in Japanese, and and some people say, well, we should never really say that because we have to be above that. Well, again, that's a kind of ego being above a word that everybody uses. And also, the etymology of the word is potentially this or potentially that. It's a, it's a whole bunch of things. But um, there have been a couple of kanji uh, characters ascribed to it. And I think they sort of sum it up. And they're, they're, it's sort of suppressing your, your suffering. You know, and just shut up and get on with it. Just say os and do the job and do the work. And the reward will come later. And you'll recognize it when it comes. In other words, don't say, well, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Which people do. Just say awesome, trust it. <laughs> so, you know, that's the title of the book. And, uh, and I think it's, it's also sort of somewhat related to ethics in that sense. So the title definitely has a lesson embedded. Yes, yes, but it's a slightly obscure. So it's catchy, I believe. It is. But it makes you want to say, oh, what does he mean by that? So then you have to do your work and you have to read the book and find out, you know, really what that means. And, uh, and that's sort of the story of karate in a way, you know. It's pretty obvious what it is, but you don't really understand it until you get working on it. And then you get more confused and more confused until you reach, you know, black belt, which is dark and dirty and confused and <laughs> dense. Right. And then, as you can see, my belt starts to get whiter and more worn out. Then right. you, you're sort of on a path towards more purity um, later on. Yeah. Well, we look forward to reading. Thank Great. you so much again. My pleasure, Susan.